In 1986, an Apex oil company barge called the Apex Houston spilled 20,000 gallons of oil off the coast of California between San Francisco and Monterey. The spill killed approximately 10,000 seabirds, including an estimated 6,300 common murs. There was dead murs and dead seabirds all along the coast from Point Reyes in that region all the way down to near Monterey. So it was over a very large section of coast. And we especially saw it at Devil Slide Rock where after the spill, uh, the colony was extirpated and there weren't any murs breeding on that rock anymore when there was once in nearly 3,000 birds breeding out there. Without directed human actions, species like the common myrrh can disappear from places and they are slow to come back on their own. Devil Slide Rock has demonstrated that with enough effort applied in a special place like this, we can help to bring them back. The marine environment stretching from Monterey Bay north to the Sonoma coast and 20 miles west to the Farallon Islands is one of the world's most productive ecosystems. These cold, nutrient-rich waters support an abundant fishery, which in turn supports the seabird and marine mammal populations. We've heard people refer to it as the meat bucket for seabirds, and there's a lot of food out there for them near shore, so it's a good spot for them to be. The common myrrh is a seabird that nests in large, dense colonies on rugged offshore rocks and islands along the Pacific coast. But despite abundant food sources, their population has experienced dramatic swings throughout the past century. The myrrhs in central California have been exploited, uh, harassed for centuries a couple centuries actually and that's put enormous pressures on this population currently we're probably looking at no more than 10 percent of historic numbers starting with the gold rush the eggs of common myrrhs were used widely by restaurants and bakeries in san francisco one report sponsored by the u.s fish and wildlife service determined that between 1848 and 1900 over 12 million eggs were taken from the nearby Farallon Islands and other colonies along the coast. In the mid-19th century, half a million myrrhs bred on the Farallons. By 1911, there were fewer than 20,000 myrrhs in the Farallons, and by the 1930s, there were only several hundred. One of the techniques that the eggers would use um, was they'd go out to an island, say the Farallons, and they would actually break up all the eggs on the rocks and then cause the birds to lay new eggs so that they would know they were fresh. And that had a, a large impact on the population. Due to their sensitivity to different threats in the marine environment, MERS are now considered important indicators of oceanic health. They are agile swimmers and divers and spend the majority of the year at sea feeding on fish and krill, returning to land only to breed. They lay a single egg that is carefully incubated for about a month. The chick then fledges three or four weeks later when it is still less than half grown. The chick is actually a pretty interesting life cycle too because when they leave the rock, when they fledge, they actually can't fly yet. They actually jump off the rock and sort of land in the ocean. And then they'll spend up to three weeks to a month with their father, the male of the pair, on the sea, being fed and then developing their strength and learning to fly. Young birds that fledge from an island will stay at sea for several years, and finally they will come back, homing to the very rock where they nested. And parent myrrhs will come back and nest on the very same spot, on the same ledge, on the same rock, year after year. With the protection of breeding colonies and abundant food sources, the population of myrrhs along the central coast started to rebound between 1950 and 1980. But with the early 80s came massive mortality from gill netting and oil pollution, decreasing the population an estimated 60%. MERS are particularly sensitive to oil spills because they, they form large rafts and 
spend a lot of time just floating on the ocean, so they come in contact with the oil, and the oil coats their feathers, and they will preen themselves and actually ingest the oil while they're preening, and oil is toxic to birds. The other threat is that they become hyperthermic because they lose their water repellency, and so then they actually um, will die of hyperthermia or also just starvation because they're too weak to feed themselves. Evidence of long-term impacts to the myrrh population was particularly apparent at the breeding colony on Devil Slide Rock, 15 miles south of San Francisco. The rock is a small but sheer sea stack rising 20 meters above the ocean and only 300 meters offshore. In 1982, there were 3,000 birds at Devil Slide Rock. By 1986, after the Apex Houston oil spill, only about 100 remained, none of which bred. And by 1988, the birds did not return at all to nest on a colony that they had been using for centuries. Certainly numbers at Devil Slide were probably lower than they had been in the beginning of the 1980s because of gill netting. But we do know that there were some birds breeding there still. But after the oil spill, um, there weren't any. Basically, it was the straw that broke the colony, you know, and uh, wiped that colony out. It was really some biologists from the Point Reyes Bird Observatory that pulled together all this information and data on how many birds were killed by this oil spill. And they brought it to the, the trustee agencies, um, the government folks who are responsible for managing these resources, these seabirds. Using these estimates from Point Reyes Bird Observatory biologists, it became clear there was a case against the Apex Oil Company, and in 1988, a lawsuit was filed under the Clean Water Act and the National Marine Sanctuaries Act to obtain damages to restore the colony. So we had good data about how many birds were actually recovered in the oil spill. The question was, what did that mean for the population? How should the public and the courts view this in terms of a natural resource damage to this ecosystem? So one of the key elements, in addition to the colony injury, was looking at this from the perspective of whether or not this was a population that was pretty separate from other populations. After a five-year legal battle, it was established that the impact of losing the 6,300 MERS and their future generations was critical to the Central California coast colonies. It also became clear that natural recovery of the Devil Slide Rock colony was not expected due to the poor state of the population. As a result, a settlement was finally reached. Apex was to pay almost $5 million to restore the common MER back to Devil Slide Rock. The challenge now was to get the MERS back onto the rock. To do this, the team of scientists turned to a technique known as social attraction, which had never been tried on the Pacific coast. Developed by biologist Stephen Kress of the National Audubon Society, social attraction uses decoys, mirrors, and recorded vocalizations of the birds to attract them to their historic breeding habitat for the purposes of renewing the colony. In the absence of other displaying MERS, MERS don't even land or come to land. They need each other as an attraction. And when they do come to land, they often crowd together into the same spot. Social attraction is a management action that suggests that if you put out other members of the same species and artifacts that look like those and sound like those, then it will attract the real bird. Because real birds don't like to land on otherwise suitable habitat without the presence of their own kind. They lay their egg on a very narrow ledge or on an outcrop of rock where they're safe from predators. They crowd together around the egg, and generally if one myrrh is there, then that will attract others to lay an egg nearby. The eggs then are central to the colony, and by crowding together, the eggs are protected by all the other myrrhs in the group. While this technique had some success with puffins on the East Coast, there was debate among local scientists whether or not the social attraction technique was the best use of resources. I mean, the basic question was, should you allow natural recovery or not? And what social, social attraction does or could do um, would be to speed up that process. 
Um, and so that was the issue that really was going through a lot of people's minds was, is this something that we need to try to do now, or uh, do we allow the system to try to, to come back to some sort of normality itself? Which it would probably have done, but it would have taken a long time. If you look at these guys here, these are The concept of birds being attracted by decoys and sound and, and the mirror boxes um, all seemed very reasonable uh, with my experience with MERS, having researched them for a number of years. And so it seemed like there was no reason, you know, why it shouldn't work. The trick is not just attracting them in, but getting them to stay. And uh, that's where all the other little toys that we use, the mirrors and the sound system, probably play a big role in keeping the birds on the rock. There was, however, a major logistical challenge, getting the decoys, mirrors, and audio equipment onto the rock. Um, remember, Harry gets the boat close, and you go when you're ready to go. Uh, and I'll be there to grab hands. We had 400 decoys and four solar panels and six solar batteries, which weigh about 50 pounds each, to get to the top of the rock. Well, yeah, there were a lot of people that said uh, it couldn't be done. This ledge here that's covered with uh, mussels and uh -huh. barnacles, it's, it's the only sort of flat spot where you can get good footing when you're hopping off on the rock. So we use it every time and we have a standard place, standard way of approaching the step. It's a pretty steep sided rock and the uh, swells build up quite high in that area. So there's quite a bit of drop between the bottom of the swell and the top of the swell. So our goal in terms of transporting people to and from the rock is to do it at the top of the wave and no hesitation, just get them off and safely onto the rock so that if the wave drops out, they don't fall into the water or the boat doesn't get jammed up against the rocks and pop the pontoon or something like that. Nobody had tried it on this level before. This is a hard project and very tough and very dangerous. I've gotten wet more than anyone, I think, on the project. I have that title. Uh, everyone has, I think, to a certain extent. Some people have actually gone in the water. Sometimes you time it right and sometimes you time it wrong. In January of 1996, after extensive planning, the team deployed their equipment onto Devil Slide Rock for the first time. It took three days of work, a lot of hard work, hauling all the gear up to the top of the rock. And if you go out there, you'll see that it looks just like a, a real mer colony. Forty-eight hours later, I went out to take a look and see if, you know, we might have any luck with some other birds showing up. And we actually had four murs on the rock acting as two pairs. Um, they were alloprening, uh, billing each other, and what we call parading, where they walk side by side with their heads bowing. And those are all uh, behaviors that indicate pairs, that they're pairing up. So within 48 hours, it seemed like we already were attracting birds back to the rock. We put the decoys up the first year and everyone had their fingers crossed and just hoping even that birds would land. And, and to have them, you know, within a couple of days have birds coming, it was just like, you know, no one, no one was ready for that. It was amazing. I mean, everyone thought it would take years before we had birds back on the rock. And to see those first two birds um, on the rock was, was thrilling. That suggests that there were some survivors from the original colony because those birds didn't go through a prospecting stage. They likely were not young birds coming and sort of checking this out among many other islands. They most likely had a history of nesting here and a memory for the homeland, if you will. And they came back and they nested that first year. The first MERS that returned to Devil Slide Rock played an important role in reestablishing the colony. Four months later, the team got another surprise when they discovered their first egg. We really didn't expect to get breeding until four or five years down the road. 
But in that first year, we had six pairs of mares breed, and we fledged three chicks. It was like getting the phone call in the, in the middle of the night. You know, you think you think something horrible was happening, but it was getting this great phone call from Mike saying the first egg had been laid, and it was just uh, amazing. So. It was remarkable how well it seemed to work, that the birds came right back. Um, and there was breeding, I guess, in the first year, um, a few pairs. And nobody can complain about that. I mean, that was, that was pretty remarkable. I think it points to the fact that if you're going to do restoration, the sooner you can start, the higher chances of your success. Um, if you, we had waited another 10 years, we might not have birds um, coming back as quickly. It's, it's really great to see um, sort of the development of a whole new way of thinking and a way of applying um, science to solve a problem. And, uh, and, I, and I think it's great. I, I welcome that sort of new twist on uh, how, how science is achieved. Each year, the number of breeding MERS has increased on Devil Slide Rock. In the 1999 season, there were 95 sites with birds with 70 breeding pairs resulting in 59 chicks fledging. The goal is to have 100 breeding pairs within 10 years. The project has also given biologists an opportunity to learn more about mer behavior and social attraction. We spend a lot of hours staring through high-powered spotting scopes to gather information to learn more about how the birds are interacting with the decoys interacting with each other and, and even interacting with other species and what it all means. As an example, we had, we believe, the same pair of birds in the same site on the rock for the first three years of the project. And this year is the first year that they actually laid an egg. And that kind of thing is really exciting. Like we were able to hold that pair for three years and the fourth year they finally bred. And, and that's what, you know, this project's all about. The first three years of the project, our, our monitoring um, consisted of doing um, scans of all the birds in the rock every five minutes and we would record each bird and their location on the rock in terms of their position, in terms of what plot they're in, where they are in that plot, and then also their behavior, what they were doing at that instance. And when we did six hours of that, three hour stints, we did that pretty much every day. One bird at one, one bird at 21. They're fun to watch. Their interactions with their mates, they will preen each other, we call alloprening, and they're very attentive to their chicks and their eggs. What are some human threats that might affect our common myrrh? Oh. Here. The Myrrh Restoration Project also presented a unique opportunity for the local community to learn about their environment and to help the scientists. We have an education component of the project, which involves um, local school children in Pacifica and Half Moon Bay. We came up with the idea because we took the decoys off the first year, and they're really dirty and covered in guano. And we had to clean them, and then we realized that they needed also needed to be repainted. So we thought of how to get these decoys painted was to involve school children and have them do the repainting for us. And it's, it's been a great part of the project. It really involves the community and the kids, and it's great for us because we need to get the decoys painted. I learned that they have different adaptations, like um, they have air sacs. Their eggs were different, that if they can't fall off a cliff, so just go around. And what do the decoys do? And they attract the mares. And why is that important? So they can have their mating thing there. Well, if there's birds there and there's the decoys are still there, I can, I can you, know, you know, tell them. Whoever is in the car, like, I painted those decoys when I was nine years old at Fairlawn View. And that'll be cool. In January of 2003, the team gathers to deploy their equipment once again. They now have eight years of experience getting to the top of the rock and strategically placing the decoys and mirrors. Most of the changes are in plots one through four. So let's just get people on plots with rods that are there, yeah. put yes. on decoys, and then going through with a drill and putting in new or taking out where you need to. This year they will use half as many decoys as they started out with, since the previous breeding season was so successful. It's really neat putting all these, putting the decoys back out in the spots and where I know 
I know exactly where these birds are going to come. And there's going to be a line of birds sitting right along here and right along there. But there'll be one that's leaning right up against this incubator. Ten down, 200 to go. We started out with about 400 decoys and now we're probably down to about 225 that we're putting out because we have so many live birds coming back now. We don't need quite as many decoys. You know, hopefully in the next couple of years we'll reduce that down to nothing. And the plan is to uh, slowly remove the mirrors and the social attraction equipment and kind of wean the birds off of the equipment and transition to having just pretty much live birds uh, with any luck. And so this mirror is going to be replaced with three decoys and then probably within the next year or two we'll, we'll actually remove the decoys themselves as well. By 2005, the rock attracted over 190 breeding pairs and fledged 133 chicks, surpassing the goal of 100 breeding pairs for the fifth year in a row. The team also installed two remote-controlled video cameras to assist researchers monitoring the colony. The signal is fed live to the internet so everyone can now view the restored colony during the breeding season. Restoration is really young. We're just learning about how to do it right. So every day, I think, you know, you're learning something that can be applied down the road in the future. Now we've shown that it does work. So we should use those type of ways of restoring the environment as well as trying to protect the natural environment in the first place and use both of those techniques to try and keep the environment from being degraded. Ultimately, nature must be allowed to take its course. The team will not deploy any decoys on the rock in 2006, and the colony is expected to successfully continue breeding on its own. A project like Devil's Slide Rock offers some hope that people can care enough to help not just be the documenters of long-term loss of colonies, but people can also work as restorers to make sure that colony by colony, we work to protect the species. And if each generation passes on the full complement of species to the next generation, we can feel that we've been successful stewards of the coast.